Well, okay, let's see. So where do we leave off? I think I left off. Think about the video I put out here or made this last weekend. Um, I left off where we got the alternators installed. The alternators are in. We've also done some expansion work. But before we go any further, I wanted to show you what I've done to get the alternators prepped. These are our ground leads here and here. They're not the hot leads. The hot leads is solid um, eighth inch thick copper bar that ties the two alternators together. And it's got the post that's hanging vertically over here. Um, the cable that we got is really heavy, a little bit big. It's an inch and almost an inch and a half across. It's 500 MCM. I didn't think about it. I got a little cocky and I wasn't thinking too awful bad about it. And I uh, went ahead and invested in getting this wire. Somebody donated it in the whole nine yards. It's, this is going to be a little bit of a challenge to get this maneuvered around everything underneath the truck, as you'll see here in a moment. But what I wanted to cover here for the moment is this is a piece of four gauge and it runs around in a big continuous loop, comes across the top of the truck and it comes down over here to this other super capacitor. So this truck came pre-equipped with an auxiliary battery position. We're going to use it. Now in the future, we are also going to delete the stock battery. That's going away. I have no time for lead acid left in my life, none whatsoever, don't care, it's got to go. So to get that battery out, we've got to remove this support and then we'll have access to be able to tilt and bring the battery out. We're going to replace this with a super capacitor. And then off that super capacitor, then we're going to have a bunch of lithium stuff in this truck. But this is where we're currently at. Now, if we zoom in here a little bit, we'll see our good friends at XS hooked us up with a brand new super capacitor for underneath the hood. But me personally, I, I like having committed things for committed spots. And since this is my vehicle, I'm not... I'm not kind of tethered to any kind of budget, really. I can get to do whatever it is I want to do to make this just the way I want. Those are three fourths inch copper lugs that I cut and made to fit directly on to the supercapacitor posts. My jumper cables that I keep in this truck are made of four aught. You can jump start a freight train with them, okay? problem is the clips are really big and they've got huge aggressive teeth and I don't feel like chewing up my little lead acid or my lead lead terminals not lead acid lead terminals that are on here so I made two pieces of sacrificial metal I can hook my jump start terminals to clink clink and we're off to the races and running now the nice thing about having super capacitors underneath the hood is I don't ever have to worry about any oxidization issues ever not once never gonna happen don't have to worry about it done fixed issue unlike a lead acid battery where this would all eventually corrode unless you cleaned everything up spotless the day that you got it and then shot it all with clear that's the only way you can stop that oxidization that takes place so um, also the other nice thing about this truck is our computer harness most of it is right here it's these leads down here so all I've got to do to properly shield everything is run some ground braid around the harness and put some clip over ferrite on that. Makes it silly easy. Although I don't think I'm really gonna need to have to worry too much about that taking into account I'm only gonna run like a 16 pill or a 24 in here. So but um let's get on to the fun bit. Let me show you what I'm talking about underneath. Down in here, there's a tiny little opening. And the only upside that we've got is the frame bends up for the wheel. Let's see if we can get this to focus via manual operation here. There's a tiny little opening that you can see between the first stage catalytic converter and the frame. And that's what you're looking at. It doesn't make any sense in the picture right now, but that's what you're looking at. And our wire's got to get routed through that space. But because our wire's so big, we've got to worry about heat, heat transfer, proximity, all that kind of stuff. Where if 
it wasn't so big, we could literally go down through here. You know what? Let's go back to auto. Let's bring this back out. And we might end up having to do this. Go down, down, over, under. You want to keep your power wires at all times on the inside of your frame rails. As being a tow operator for a small portion of my life, I cannot tell you how important it is that you always run your, your power wires on the inside of your frame. You don't want to go on the outside of the frame. You got to be inside the frame rail. So this is the outside of the frame rail into the outside of the car and on the inside of the frame rail. If you get T-boned or get slammed into or the vehicle rolls, rolls over, if you are on the outside of the frame, that power wire is probably going to get pinched. Well, because it's mostly fuseless, at least this system will be, um, you're basically driving around an atomic bomb waiting for it to explode if somebody runs into you. Whatever you do, don't ever take your power wires and run them through your fender well under the door. That's the biggest no-no in installation of them all. We're going to lift the truck up here in a minute, and we're going to see what it's really going to take for us to get this giant, giant-ass power wire routed to where we can go along the frame or somewhere in between and poke it up through the floor. And this, I believe, is going to be a little bit of a process. It's so tight underneath here. They even took the factory harness and they put it on the outside edge of the frame. And then they chased the outside edge of the frame the whole length of the vehicle. This is the problem that we're having. Is the opening that what I'd be normally going through has got a catalytic converter in it. There's a little bit on the transmission side space, like through here, a little bit of a space. And I can run up the middle of the truck through here, a little bit of a space, and then go on top of the fuel tank, and then go underneath the fuel tank, or over the top of the fuel tank, and then hook around and come back up through over here. The other option is just to follow the frame rail like they did and then hook it back up into this hole. But I don't think I'm going to have enough room taking into account the monster size of the cable. So I think what I'm going to have to do is come down here and cross over the top of the frame like in here someplace and then run this direction through here and then cross over and go up and go above the fuel tank which will pop me out now that we've removed the fender well flare cover mud flap whatever it'll pop me out somewhere in here I gotta magically make it through this space do a 180 and then come out through the wall so if we come in here on the inside of the cab we find that this is mostly padding and this whole edge here is a false floor. So that'll poke me out right through here and then I can have my distribution blocks underneath this seat. Yeah, we'll go with that. Shit. Here. Which I've got enough room to be able to get the wire snuck through here and then cross over on this cross member support here. And that'll allow me to sneak on the back side of the gas tank and make the turn into the cab. But it's cluttered underneath here. Or it's by a bunch of stuff that's stupid hot that I definitely do not want to fool with. So. I think we're going to go up this side of the truck, up the middle. We're going to tuck behind the heat shield. We're going to cross here, cross over the top of the fuel tank, and then back into the cab. Yeah. Let me just reiterate. There's this nice, easy path down the length of the frame. Unfortunately, because we're going to be driving around a LTO high amperage bomb, I don't want to go through here. 
that would definitely be the easiest. For sure. I mean, for sure. It's just this side impact. I just, oh my God. My God. Yeah, we're gonna have to go the long way around. I love it when people tell me how my equipment's supposed to work. You don't need the $690 shoe adapted wireless microphone. You don't need it. I just use XLR, it makes me famous. So we are now joined by Nate and his wife, Heather. And it's dark as frig out here now. Yeah, it's okay, we don't have to talk softly. Everybody knows you're here. Say hi, Nate. Hi, Nate. <laughs> Say hi, Heather. Hi, Heather. Yeah. We're so See, she's comedians. A, she's a ham operator and she's got huge boobs. So you know what that means? That's 60 dBs over the rest of us. That's right. Well, That's right. Maybe 40 over mine. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what they say, a girl's voice on the radio. Yeah, it's an extra 30 dBs. Look at this, look at how we ran this. This was a motherfucker. If it wasn't for my buddy, Nate, this would have never happened tonight. Yeah. So we had to go down around the outside of frame, around the river, through the woods, up and over, back and around, over the top, past the gas, and then, and then it came up by the, the wheel well to grandmother's house with a little hot vagina sauce on top. So anyhow, we're going to shoot more of this tomorrow, and uh, we're going to wait until the sun's up, though. Yo. All this work for these two leads, the distribution box can be there on the floor. And I gotta run a vacuum cleaner through here, but this is, uh, they're in, it's, it's in. Let me, uh, let me lift the truck up and we'll show you the underside of it real quick. So it comes down from the firewall and this is a reinforced zone and then it, comes along the inside of the frame rail with the rest of the wiring harness and the rest of the wiring harness for the whole truck ducks inside the frame so we ducked it inside of the frame too and crossed it over and it crosses over now the drive lines like a mile and a half away it looks like in camera remember there's no field of depth with the camera but the drive line looks like it's right here. It's not. There's a mile of distance. It's all the way up on the roof. And that disappears behind a heat shield, crosses over the fuel tank, and pokes up right about here. Right about here through the firewall, or through the floor. But this was a chore. We got, and, and, and don't let your eyes deceive you. That's the biggest, thickest wire loom that you can buy. Actually, what that is is a rigid shop vac hose that we turn into wire loom as our rub guard. I'll show you that here in just a minute. Well, let me set this thing down. I am tired of being underneath here. I'm, I'm here to tell you what. My hands feel like hamburger this morning. Fingers splitting in two. <laughs> I love installs. Okay, so we got the wire up into the cab this morning. We got it run last night due to the great help of my friend Nate. Um, that was no small feat. I'm not going to lie. And that was really a lot of work. So let me absolutely stress that this is absolutely not necessary what I'm doing for the amount of current that I am generating you you can easily get away with running much smaller much smaller wire you could run like oh one piece of four-aught 
or 250 MCM and be able to get the same results but this comes down to whose thing's bigger mine or the next guy's and I I like big and I tell you I'm not going to settle so being that there's not a distribution block on the market that is made for inch and three-fourths inch wire um, that is an AC industrial grade I got to make my own this is a um, shoot what did I buy here this is half inch thick um, Yeah, it's half inch thick Lexan. Anyhow, I love this stuff. It's bullet resistant. Um, I got exposed to this as a young kid. My dad had some of this at his shop, at the place that he worked at. And we built a semi-ballistic non-rated shield out of this stuff for my science class when I was in junior high. So, this will sit like so underneath the seats. And it'll be perfectly crystal clear. No, this is not acrylic. This is Lexan. This is very soft plastic. I hate working with plexiglass. It's hard and it's brittle and it snaps really, really easy. So, this is going to sit carpet side down. It's going to have these giant wires coming into it. I mean, there's really nothing that I can put up here that's going to give you a decent idea of scale. Um, other than the connectors are an inch and a half wide. Okay, so this is some four inch, uh, four and a half inch um, copper stock that we're going to reverse bolt through. With a combination of some hardware here, we are going to. create ourselves a little meager distribution block with some hardware like this like this and I'm going to populate these plate edges with holes like so like so so I can get your standard one aught gauge eyelet to sneak down in here I did not think this all the way through. I should have had these eyelets ready. I'm sorry. I can have one of my standard one aught gauge eyelets. Sit down in here on the hardware like this. Got a bunch of stainless steel washers. Even got wing nuts that. I'll have all thread out here in the middle that pokes through that I can suck the plate down flat with and I can have another set screw over here to keep this all level. But on a little bit more serious of a note, current's got to flow both ways. So I'm going to have that LTO battery in the bed of the truck back here. In an acrylic box. I'm waiting, still waiting for the big sheet of Lexan to show up for me to make that with. I had to buy special glue to glue it together, and then we're going to backfill the Lexan box with um, two part acryl uh, clear epoxy. <coughs> make it impact bullet resistant for the most part. So I got to create this to give myself something to attach to, and that. But I needed to get the basic dimensions down, and that's what I did with the L sharp A marks here. You can't really see them, but they're there. I wanted to get the base dimensions down on where these eyelets are going to land. Because I only get one opportunity to cut this wire. There's no slack left anywhere. I mean, it's in there. It is strapped, and I'll, I'll take you underneath the truck and show you before I, I get it all put back together. But it, I mean, it is in there, that wire. We had to go along the length of the frame of the truck, tuck over the frame, in between the frame and the cab. We followed the stock wiring harness and the cutoff. I had to go back by the transfer case, or across to the transfer case, and then hook up. And then it's between the gas tank, which is uh, plastic, 
it's got heat shields all the way around it. So it rides that heat shield all the way to the back and then it crosses back across and then comes out the floor back this direction. There was no other way to do it. Our, my other option would be to take all the interior out of the truck, at least one half of it, take half the dash out, have the wire come through the firewall, I don't know where, um, and have it right underneath the carpet, which would have worked if I wouldn't have had wire that was this big around. It would have thrown all the dimensional layout of the carpet completely out of whack. So, okay, let's uh, let's get on with getting the the eyelet or the wire cut and the eyelet on it for the positive side in the truck, and I'll show you that here in a second. Well, I just committed. I full out committed, and I cut the positive lead. This is all that's left. This is about four and a half feet of this wire. Um, the first piece I wanted to put on because I wanted to see how big of a, a, a nightmare that was going to be. So this one I thought I would share with you guys. Now remember this is like soft rubber almost bordering on silicone. This is welding lead. This is incredibly high strand count. My buddy Mike gave me a good hook up here. This is high temp jacketed wire. I mean, this is well resistant. It's got a little ick on the inside of the jacket. No, we're just gonna peel it this way. I learned last time. Okay. What I mean by a little bit of ick is it's got a little bit of glue and then there's threads in here to help protect the wire jacket. This is like a tire almost. Oh, okay, you're gonna be nice. You're gonna start nice and smooth for me or you're gonna fight me like the last one. Oh, it's gonna fight me. I'm gonna hog this out just a little bit. Help me get started. Kidding you, this is like retarded amount of strands that are in this thing. Now your regular 500 MCM's got about, about 200 strands of wire in it. This has got a bit more. And what I mean by hog it out is we hollow out the eyelet and give it a little bit more of a taper. Make it a little bit easier to ramp this wire down in here. Have to get forceful. I'll be right back. You want one set of dies bigger than this. So, okay. To make this work, I've got to put that through there, this through here. Now, because the connection is so big, we're going to have to do multiple crimps. Once again, let me reiterate that this is completely unnecessary for the average home gamer. This is me just being a dick, basically. back the dies off and we're going to go ahead and we're going to rotate this to 
right about there. Jack. Okay, last crimp. So, once again, I'm going to advocate soldering of the eyelet, even though there's going to be guys out there that are like, what, what? Tell you, my friend just did a huge class on uh, uh, solar system installs. And he brought this subject up in this class because we built the thing together that he's currently running. And we took FLIR data and presented it to that class of students and said, hey, you know, there's more to it than just crimping a wire. If you go and you solder it, there's a calculated question, X amount of exclamation point efficiency increase. And here's some visual data to help you understand that. And then on top of that, then we did an amp data, current loss, and efficiency ratio data. And the DC world is very important, I feel. I'll argue that with anybody, anytime. This is a chore. This is not easy to get these things on. But I love the huge amount of metal mass and I love the huge amount of contact surface. So let's get out the blowtorch. Let's backfill an eyelet. The point I was trying to make is you do what you feel is best for your setup, okay? These are professional installers that this class was taught to, and their minds were like blown. Now, we took an eyelet and we filled it full of, filled it full of solder and then completely cut it in half. And we found that only the top end of the eyelet was full of solder. The cold weld process, if you've done the eyelet property, properly, will not wick back down the lead. The solder won't lick, uh, wick back down the lead is what I'm getting at. If you've done the crimping process properly. The whole point is to make the billions of little strands of wires at the tip of the eyelet have a nice mechanical connection and an electrical connection in the same breath. It's one. Two more to go and one I've got to do inside of a vehicle. Well, two of them i got to do inside a vehicle. <sighs> so, in the same breath now that we've got the mechanical electrical bond completed, which in effect seals the tip of the eyelet from moisture getting into it. Now we want to seal the wire from being able to let moisture get into it. And we want to bolster the joint, the physical connection between the wire lead and the eyelet. And we do that with marine grade slash military slash heavy duty slash industrial big boy. Ain't backing up, ain't gonna stop, ain't gonna give none. Heat shrink with epoxy. Now this is a water joint, tight joint completely. And I feel perfectly happy putting this joint up against my frame out in a moisture environment. And I know that this connection, short of the physical connection here between here and the frame, this eyelet's not gonna corrode, it's not gonna have water get in it. I'm not gonna have water um, wick its way up 
a lead and cause all kinds of problems. This is how I ended up routing this inside. The fender well came off. I had to take the fender well off. There's, there's a fender well in here. Um, that's that same connection that we made make that S turn. That wire is bent this way, that way, and then back through the cab. Whew, what a pain. Anywho, um, cleaned all the bare metal, down to bare metal underneath the eyelet. And like I've said before, Where is the nut? Did my nutage fall off? It must have, there's nothing back there. Hmm. Well, let me grab another one. Imagine where that goddamn wire, uh, the nut got off to. Or double lock nut it, or double, double, washed and then it's got a captive nut on it too. <laughs> Found the other nut. <laughs> My dumbass. You'll think this is funny. Put it on the wrong piece of hardware. Honest engine. <laughs> that ain't coming off. Okay, paint it and put the fender wall back in. Ooh. All right, so. This is gonna be our distribution block layout. Like I said in a previous couple segments, they don't make distribution blocks as big. So, I'm gonna to have to make my own. Like this one, these two studs are gonna run the, um, the radio set in the front of the truck, the whole center console control, and, and probably this one and this one will be the batteria. And uh, like this one and this one will be the amplifier. And that'll leave me two extra access points, but <clears throat> it won't be this tall. It's going to be much shorter because these uh, bolts, we're going to recess into the Lexan. And then, like I said, we're going to put a, a little sandwich lid over the top. Now, I got more Lexan. It showed up yesterday, thank God. Grab this little tiny sheet of this stuff. Um, we got another little sheet of it here that we are going to convert into the battery case. So I'm really grateful this showed up because uh, this is the, one of the last major pieces I need to construct. And then also what showed up is this, these two things. This is black fiberglass that I'm gonna to use to reinforce that copper bus underneath the hood. Because believe it or not, that 500 MCM wire is kinda of stiff and it's real rigid and the copper bus that I have the 500 MCM attached to is really soft. So I needed to come up with something to make it a little bit, have a little bit more mass to it. And here is the magic schmoo that is going to make it so that we can put the batteries in the Lexan case and not have the batteries move around. Which is yet another thing I gotta research and figure out how to get done this weekend. Cause I gotta get off of this project. I mean, I've gotta get off this project. I've gotta get done doing this. It's, this is consuming way too much time. Although I am having fun. This is consuming too much time and I need to be doing other things. There's many, many, many other big projects I've got to be doing on, working on. And this, although it is for myself and I spend most of my time working on stuff for you all, 
I do need to um, quit being selfish and work on customers projects. So I took a whole week now. This has consumed a whole week to get this far. It's literally working at it this every day, getting one thing or another done. So it's time to get off this and get on to doing other things. So I'm going to burn up the next couple days trying to get this organized and put together, which desperately needs to happen just so I can get my darn truck back. So on that note, here we go. Time lapse. Woo, time lapse.
So, the idea is, is that we're going to have a bolt sit in the relieved area, and then we're going to put a star washer on top of it. Now these are designed not to sit flush for a reason. So then this is going to sit down on here, like so. And we're going to have some screws holding it in place. So everything we bolt to it can't spin because of the star washer. But it's just designed to hold it just tight enough that it can move freely if it needs to, but it shouldn't need to move at all. But first things first. Let's put our caption bolts in. Yep, got them drilled out just the right depth. Let's go over here to the tools. <sighs> so I love about Lexan. Downside of Lexan is it's really easy to scratch. Upside of Lexan is you can tighten bolts against it and it doesn't shatter like plexiglass. So now we're going to have our plates, all our hardware, and then we've got our mounting plate that will insulate all of our connections and keep us from having a fire or any potential shorts or any shit like that. bit of wing nut action to tighten it down with the end of the game. It's gonna look pretty freaking hot in my opinion. We got about two dozen little jiggly parts that we got to get lined up just perfect to make this work. So like I said it's gonna be plate, bolt, star washer, the hole. Now to ease in the assembly, we are going to put just the nut on there and we're going to just put it on loose. It doesn't need to be tight.
So we're minimizing our little loose jiggly bits by going to the plastic surgeon and getting the labiaplasty done and the boob job. And we're getting some Botox injected in her. See, the idea is here behind what I'm doing now, this step, is as I'm trying to mount this over these four screws, I don't want to have to try and keep all of these nuts and bolts and all the hardware lined up. So once we get it mounted down, we're not going to even have a problem. And you know what? The thickness of the plate versus the thickness of the, the bolts. Hmm. I think I just might do that. Nah. Let's leave it loose. I was thinking I'd put a nut on each one of these and help hold them down. But I think we're way over killing it. We're engineering something simple into something complex. And I hate when people do that. That is my teacher. So the scale of things here is a little confusing. I mean, this turned out okay in my opinion. I'm really quite tickled with this. Um, like I said, I counter drilled for the bolts. They barely are sitting down in the holes. And that's just to help keep everything orientated and locked in. And that'll help with uh, torsion load. Okay. So, and I'm gonna go and I gotta drop some I got some two-part very special special Lexan Sinelic glue that I ordered for, well, the other portion of this video, which you guys are have yet to shoot, and you're gonna see here in just a little bit. But ah, we got this big ass wire going to these big ass terminals. And I know people, oh was that's too thin, why didn't you? Man, that's that's some thick ass copper dude that the scale of what we're working with here um, <laughs> this is this is very well thought out there's more than enough surface area 
and there's more than enough surface area of this plate to adequately carry the amount of current that's going to get applied <laughs> to this portion of the electrical system. Faith, the math has been done and it's been tested elsewhere. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the power supply video. Underneath my workbench I've got two giant plates like this. And right in the center I got a piece of four gauge. This, this will do the job. The amount of current that the alternators produce, the amount of current that's going to flow from the supercapacitors through this, this surface area, um, the LTO batteries, all of that, this, this will do the job easily, like with a 50% margin of current, you know, safety. Okay, um, I want to get this in the truck. And for us to do that, we've got a hydraulically crimp prep, mount, get on these, get these eyelets on the wire in the truck, crimp them, and then backfill them with solder and stuff and be ready to mount this plate. The plate I'm going to literally have free floating in the truck. Where it's going is underneath the seat. It's literally the seat is going to only allow like a quarter of an inch of clearance and then the carpet is very short. So we're going to take hook, the, the hook side of Velcro and we're going to put it on the back side of this. And the 500 MCM wire, there's only going to be about this much of a lead, maybe a foot worth of lead going into it. Um, it's sandwiched between a seat. It's going to be held down by pressure. Uh, resistant load of Velcro plus the physical uh, tension of the wires. I cannot, I would love to be able to drill and put a screw from here through the floor, like four of them. Directly below the floor I've got one layer of metal, a layer of liner plastic, another layer of metal, and then another layer of metal, then I have the fuel tank. And I am not going to run the risk of punching a hole in my fuel tank. I don't think it's necessary to secure this. But here we go about mounting this down. I got bigger concerns like how are we going to melt down the LTO battery and that kind of stuff. That stuff has to be bolted down. This distribution block, the way, the way it's put together with the material it's made of, I have zero concerns. I freaking love Lexan. It is, I mean the history with me and Lexan goes back almost 30 years. I remember 12 year old child playing around with this stuff um, and this would stop a 22 bullet probably a 38 it might grab a 45 if I've got a piece of extra Lexan left over when I'm done with this I am going to take it out and shoot it so we'll get some ballistic ratings on this I, maybe we'll see I don't want to run any chances of YouTube demonetizing me because of that we got some weird rules going on right now. Anyhow, it's time for me to pack all the tools out to the truck. Um, I got 95% tint on the back of the truck, so it's kind of like a dark hole, but we'll see how it turns out after I open up all the doors and everything. And let's get this in. Um, I want to get my power wires secured and safed. You're going to make me happier as a human being. Before we go and get in the truck, I wanted to cover this. This is shop vac. This is made by Rigid. This is rigid shop bag. Now, you guys are all familiar with little tiny wire loom that we put on stuff in vehicles, right? Well, I discovered a long time ago with my white truck, how I have that mounted is I have clamps that go around the pipe. And because it's an older style truck with not all the emissions shit on it, and the fuel tanks in the back, I literally, in a big giant C channel instead of a box channeled frame, I took and I ran this down the inside of the frame and then I put a pulled string through it and I could just pull wires through it. And this will hold up to four pieces of four gauge comfortably. In this particular truck, I had to employ this a different way. I ordered this and then I had to think about it for a hot minute. I want the, the resistance rub cap capabilities of this, but because the wire is so heavy, there's no way I'd ever be able to get it to pull through all the bends in this. So I had to get creative. This stuff cuts relatively easily with a razor knife. So let's whittle off a piece. And the reason I wanted to cover this before I go out and I start working on getting the distribution blocks in is I really want to cover the wire safety bit. <clears throat> when you're routing your wire, you have to make sure that you've got it completely away from any heat source like exhaust. And you cannot run it through any kind of pinch points that would flex. Like the fuel tank is attached to the frame, the frame's attached to the body, the body's going to flex and move. And that's the reason it's on rubber bushings. They've got the body up on mounts, okay? 
you can't run that wire anywhere where it's going to get pinched from the body flexing of body roll. And you want to have this all the way around your wire because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. If you don't have something in there that's going to be a rub guard, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when the truck's going to burn to the ground. Because we're running completely non-fused systems and a lot of these mobiles that we guys are putting together, all of us, you, me, everybody else, um, just simply because our fuse block would be 30 feet wide to be able to carry the current. Um, and a lot of us don't have access to the, the Steve Mead, you know, machines that he's got down there cutting out custom billeted things to hold fuse panels. I, I was watching one of his videos the other day and he built this, this, this fuse block or had it made or built it or whatever. And he's taking all these, these, you know, four or five aught wires and hooking it to it and he's putting on these little fuses on each one of them I'm like no way no way you have to take your rub surface like this and you have to guard it not all of us are building show trucks a lot of us want to build ride around vehicles that are going to get dirty and going to get muddy and we're not going to crawl underneath there or put them up on our lift and inspect them a lot you have to use something like this uh, my business partner's truck we used Liquitite you have to have a rub guard on the wire. So, how I overcame it is now we have the thickest wire loom money, the thickest, biggest round wire loom money we can buy. Take a wire, lay it down in here, and then what I did with the wire in the truck is I rolled this inside of itself and then put zip ties around it. No rub on wire, even though it's welding lead and it's got the oil resistant jacket on it and blah, blah, blah. You still have to have a rub guard. And I meant to cover that, but I was so tired of being underneath the truck and I was, so, I was just physically tired that it didn't pop into my head until right now. Well, I'm away from that section of the video, but it's in this particular segment. And I really wanted to take a minute and kind of be the harpy and harp on this for a minute and be like, you have to have a rub guard on the wire. It has to have this, this will help very little with heat resistance, but what it does help with is impact strike and rub wear, where it's up against some metal and it's moving. Food for thought. Okay, safety lecture over, let's go play. So here we are out in the truck. I'm just doing a little dry fit. It fits perfect. So now what I got to do is I got to manipulate this man sausage onto this connector like so. Okay. And this ground lead is like so. Yeah, this is going to work great. This pins perfectly. The top of that bolt pins perfectly against the seat of the truck. This will sit here. Velcro will keep it from sliding around. God, it's going to work out great. It's absolutely going to work out great. So before I do this, um, what did I do with my Sharpe? Here it is. So this is going to sit like so, and I need to cut wire like so. Let's give it just a hair more. move this out of the equation for a few minutes because we're not going to need it for a while. Yay, now the fun part. We got our towel laid down. Now, oh, okay. It's 
It's about 20 pounds. That's all I have out of that 21 feet. That's all I got left. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, there's no redos in this. So let's remeasure that again. Yep. Okay. Okay, now I gotta beat it with a hammer. Well, I mean beat it on with a hammer. You gotta beat it on with a hammer. These eyelets are incredibly tight. There's always one or two little wires that pop out. Hey, 99.99999% of the wires inside that eyelet. <laughs> okay. Like the one I did up underneath the hood, it's uh I dremeled out the back side of this and I increased the taper. I was able to get a million percent of the wire in there but so this is our seat latch because once I crimp this thing it's never moving again this eyelet it's never gonna happen so I wanted to dry fit here verify yep it's gonna work out great okay let's move the distribution plate out of the way again And let's start our crimping process. Oh, here, give me some good. There we go. Ground is completed. Now the question is, do I finish out the ground or I go and do the hot? Here's the dilemma. Ground right now, if I finish this out, put the heat shrink on it, I can cover this with tape, then I have enough safe space to work on this. If I leave this uncovered so I can solder both of them at the same time and put the heat shrink on them at the both the same time, I have the chance of having the two poles touch, which I cannot have, because we're hooked up to two super caps right now that are charged and stuff, and the stuff is such a booger to work with, I'm not gonna even attempt to take it off unless I have an absolute necessary need. So I'm gonna solder this first, heat shrink it for final assembly, and then I can cover this with insulating, well, I guess I could cover this with insulating electrical tape now and just solder them both at the same time. Let's do that. One up in here to to do this. 
just sitting here thinking to myself how absolutely graced I am to be able to do all of this. Have all the tools, the crimpers, all, all the stuff and all the people that have taught me things to get this far. Like the camera that we're sitting here watching this get filmed on right now. The kick-ass tripod my business partner got me. All the crap that goes along with making this, this dog and pony show happen. I didn't do this all by myself. I've had a lot of people help me. And it just blows my mind. The fact that I've got all the right tools to do this job, just right at my disposal all the time. There was a time where I wanted to do this kind of stuff. And I just didn't have the right tools. Or my life wasn't structured enough to be able to get this somebody coming to me and want to get this done themselves or have me do this for them. I wasn't set up for that. And Doop. Now we don't want to overdo it. We're just filling up the hole. We're just kissing this eyelet full of full of solder. There we go. We're done. I give that a half an hour to cool down. That's a one pound roll of solder. And I used like half of it. And all I was doing was filling from this crimp point to here. And maybe back to about here. If you do your crimps properly, or you sit there and you wick too much shit in it, it can run up the wire and make this wire stiff. We don't want that. We want this to stay nice and flexible. And then we'll come along and we'll support this with heat shrink, like I've said in many, 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 many videos. Trying to gain down a little bit, so maybe you can see a little bit better. So I'm just drizzling this in a hole. So we're filling up the space at the end of the eyelet. We're just drizzling that in a hole. So that was a half of that stick. Just drizzled down in the hole. Now we're just going to heat this. And when the metal gets hot enough, its pores will expand. And the lead's already in a liquid state, but it's not absorbed in anything. So the pores of the eyelet will extend, the metal, the, the metal pores of the eyelet will expand a little bit. And we'll just slide a little bit of lead and tin inside. And the same thing with the nickel plated copper stranded wire that's on the inside of this 500 MCM. Well, we cause a nice, smooth, very low resistance connection. Takes a minute. Here it goes. Boop. And normally I'd be moving this, this, this torch all over the place. But I got seat belts, I got carpet, I got all these fancy interior pieces I gotta worry about not torching here. Look at hot. Come on. Shuck it in, suck it in. Okay. So swallow, big girl. Swallow. Let it all in you. Woo, warm. We're done. We're done. Oh, I was nervous about this part. Really was. Okay, now to crawl back out of here. Let's get some heat shrink and uh, yeah, let's do it to it.
can definitely tell it's mating season. The squirrels are out here running back and forth like they're on a freeway right now. And I haven't put it out in the, the squirrel newsletter yet, but their tree that they live in over here, we're taking out here shortly. That right there, what I just did, is the reason why I've got a towel down below what I'm working on. Oh, slide. There you go. I just set the towel on fire a little bit. And if I would have gotten a carpet, the interior in here, I would have never forgiven myself. Come on. Okay. Now that we're hot and we're malleable. Put a little, a little kink in its bend this way. So when we go to put the plate down, it's not going to constantly have the uh, torque load on it. So it's warm, it'll be a little bit more flexible for us to play with. All right, let's do the positive side. Don't worry about the discolorization in the heat shrink. I will. I've got a fix for that. It's called acetone, acetone, acetone. Okay. Now let's give this a good 20 minutes or so to cool down. My battery's got to be about done on the camera. Okay, gents. Okay. Now, let's do 
do washer, washer, star, star, uh, zerk nut, whatever the hell these things are called, retainer nuts, whatever they're, they've already got a lock pattern on the back of them. And as AVZ, AVE puts it, we're going to bump rattle these in place. get us started. <laughs> oh, I need a different socket. Hold on. Uh, let's re this a little bit. Wonderful. That looks wonderful. Oh, that looks wonderful. Oh, that makes me happy. So much work to get to just this point. But I know I've got myself a really good distribution system. Hold on, let me change camera angles for you. I'm never going to get this right. <clears throat> Let me insert a picture right here and we'll show you what I was talking about. This, God, this looks good. Okay. 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 This is yet another sheet of half inch thick Lexan. Um, I guess sneeze. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is plexiglass that's on here, and this is some scrap pieces that I had just laying around here, and I put it on the top and the bottom to keep this while it was sitting here in the shop, um, getting banged into anything and us having an explosion. Um, we already know there's enough current in here stored in these cells to run a 16 pill for 45 minutes. We proved that on video. These are the LTO batteries. These are the ones that you can literally run a jackhammer through and nothing happens. Some smoo comes out. No smoke, no fire, doesn't get hot. But still, this is a very paper thin aluminum case that these things are in. And for them to put, be put in a vehicle, you got to put them inside of some kind of cabinet to protect them, right? So I thought, well, we're using Lexan. Why not just go ahead and make some Lexan? So I bought myself this sheet. It took forever to get here. And hopefully I have enough. I think I do. Now, the original plan was to double down on this bank. But uh, excess is, well, sold completely out. You guys bought them completely out of batteries. I did that series of videos on these, and you guys jumped on board like, pff, like crazy. And sold completely out of all the LTLs, LTOs. And they are vastly back ordered at the moment. So originally this bank was going to be twice this size. We're going to go with the little 12 pack and we're going to see how far we can take it. With a thousand amps of generation underneath the hood and a huge amount of storage here, we already know that I can run anything I want from a 32, we'll probably end up at a 48 or a 64 pill at some point trying it. So. Let's get on with making ourselves a box. I've got to cut this very, very square. Then I got to sand all the edges on all the pa on all the panels. Then we're going to glue it together, and then we're going to suspend the cells that the top, that like the bottom half of these. I'm going to submerge in epoxy. We're going to backfill this with two part crystal clear acrylic epoxy, and then I'm going to put some rods down in here that we can. Um, attach some nuts and bolts to to pull a, a cap down on top. But we're going to make ourselves a little safety box 
for this out of this half inch Lexan. Now, the last time I worked with Lexan and glue and stuff, I was in junior high, so I'd have been 14, 14 or 15, 14 years old, 13 or 14 years old, um, as far as like in a shop project. The problem with not forgetting a whole awful lot most of the time is that you don't forget a whole awful lot most of the time. I don't forget an awful lot. Although I do have a tendency to forget what I'm doing at that moment. So we're gonna cut this. Um, we're gonna make a cut here, another cut here for the top and bottom lids. Then we're gonna have to make another cut for the two side panels and probably a third cut out of this. So by the time we're said and done, we might have maybe this much left if we're lucky. And if XS ever gets around to sending me these other caps that they said that they would, um, the cells, I mean, I will be able to uh, just build another one. And we'll just put it in line. Okay, let's do some fancy dancy measurements and we'll get out the circular saw because according to this English, Japanese, Chinese, Italian, French, German, um, Korean, Malaysian, Atlantic, Romanian, Bolognian, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, German, French, Dutch, Chechnyan um, instructions. We're safe to cut with a circular saw, safe to cut with a jigsaw, safe to cut by hand, water resistant, UV rated, not step related. No dumb here. No dumb here. It's okay to use a pallet bit on it, as we've seen earlier, because that's how we went about hogging it out earlier. But it's no step related. No dumb. No dumb here. Lexan. Lexan. Okay, so, got ourselves our box made, and it is glued, like beyond glued. Now, I still got the protective film on this, so it should be fairly clear after we get the epoxy made. I'm going to mix this plus this and this and then very carefully pour this into here and it should fill it up to about here which is all I'm looking for. I just want to anchor the uh, LTOs in place make it so they can't vibrate around and nothing can puncture or hit them the protection comes from this quarter inch thick thing of Lexan. It really does. So before I go and I submerge this thing, I have noted that my battery, I did not assemble it completely square. I got to loosen up this and this and I got to move this around and adjust a couple things. But I wanted you to see it before I filled it up with the resin. Now I'll be back after we fill this up with the resin everything man freaking Lexan dust gets on everything okay I'm gonna glue this together wish me luck epoxy is curing and it's come out better than I thought it would I stripped the outer coat off now that all the sticky bits done and four to six hours. Well, we'll see what we got. So in the intermedium, kind of interested to see if XS has changed their design any. Oh, sweet, new sticker. Yay. I can replace the one I got up there now. Yay. Little instruction card. We're not gonna follow that. 10,000 amps of storage. Just like that. A lot of schmoo inside this box. Potential for it anyhow. Hey, they've upgraded their lights too. 
Kick ass, man. Show what I mean here. Old light. New light. The speaker wire is soft and malleable instead of this harder stuff. And the leads not being supported. The leads are heat shrinked and supported. Awesome. Thanks guys at XS. So if you haven't put all the pieces of the puzzle yet together, the stock battery underneath the hood of my truck, I'm gonna replace it with another super capacitor. And the uh, lead acid's going bye-bye. Not, not to ever be seen again. And uh, we're gonna go completely on LTO. So this lithium tech is what I'm gonna use from now on in my truck. And even though the cap bank is half the size that I wanted, or the, the lithium cell is half the size that I wanted it to be, that's fine. I'm okay with that. It is what it is. It is what it is. <clears throat> this would be the equivalent of eight. 16 volt battery banks or uh, 18 volt battery banks and I can pick it up and carry it underneath my arm uh, think about that let that sink in for a hot minute this little tiny capacitor or this little tiny battery bank has the same equivalent output power as like six or seven 12 volt batteries with an extra six volt cell to it at 18 volts that one under load operates at 16. So battery, 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 battery. And there's no maintenance. This will literally last decades. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying that in a serious, like it's figuratively it will factually last decades versus those lead acid batteries, which will only last a couple years, especially the way us radio operators run them. Shit goes bad quickly, downhill. So, let me get the leads on this thing. I remember how revolutionary this was when I first got one of these. God, I hate star foam. I hate star foam. How big of a deal it was when I first got one of these, and now that everybody and their brother is using them. Um, groundbreaking. Very helpful groundbreaking technology here. There's 10,000 amps worth of storage inside this thing right here. Max amps, 10,000. Watt hours, 18.2 watt hours. Capacitance, 500 farad. Operating temperature, negative 40 Fahrenheit to a positive 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Operating voltage, 12 to 16.2. And we're gonna run at 15.9. Bet your ass, almost 16 volts is what we're gonna run this truck at. I think it's going to be cool. I had to charge one of these for a long time and I wanted to cover this. I did a whole YouTube video just on supercapacitors and how to charge them and how to hook them up. And I made it really clear. <laughs> like, really, really, really clear. And I still get this comment or the question. I, I don't understand which side do I hook the, the light bulb up to? Because everybody thinks they've got to hook it up to get the light bulb to work, positive to negative. You don't. You're gonna hook up your ground, hook up the ground, hook up one lead of the light bulb to the positive lead, and then your charge wire up to the opposite side of the light bulb. It's that complicated. Now, if you don't have access, and I'm saying in a pinch, now according to the book, this is the way they want you to set it up. If you don't have access to, let's say the positive side of the capacitor, that's just fine. Tighten this back down real quick. Guess what? The electrical pixies don't give a shit which way the current's gonna flow into the cap. It ain't gonna hurt nothing as long as you don't reverse the polarity. And this is, I had one guy specifically ask me this. He's like, it, it, I can't, dude, I'm gonna screw up the capacitor. I can't get to the one side. No, you're not. 
current still flowing in. All this does is act like a shock absorber and allow us to slowly wick the electrons into the capacitor. And once you get the voltage up to about, oh, you know, like 10 volts or so, you can really start pouring the current on. Like you can really, 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 really start pouring on the current. The cap can take it. It's this initial startup, the initial voltage going in is when you have the hardest time. You can damage the cap when the volts are low, down to depleted almost nothing. So just thought I'd cover that. It works both ways, but according to the book, they want you to hook up ground and put the light bulb on the positive side. Just saying. Just saying, okay? Well, <clears throat> it's been four hours. The stuff is cured. The cells are now reasonably cool, but they are locked in place. They ain't gonna move behind bullet resistant plastic. We got ourselves a good little lid. I left the, uh, the liner on this so it's still opaque for a moment. But that's how this box is gonna look when it's done, just crystal clear like this, all the way around. So I have my lead coming off, lead coming off. We're done. So. It's now dark out, it's like nine o'clock at night, but I'm excited because I'm gonna be like on all LTO here in just a minute. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, super caps charged. Let's go put this in the truck and let's think about building some power wires to it. What do you guys think? Okay, so we're back outside the truck now and we've got our battery location issues and all those kinds of things figured out inside a cab. Where we left off last night is we were getting the uh, LTO batteries set up in their Lexan case. We've got that done, they got them installed. So what we got going on here is a battery charger and it's hooked up to this super capacitor. Well, <clears throat> LTO batteries being what they are, we're gonna change out up here, we're gonna change out this lead acid battery. It's gotta go. And we're gonna change it to a super capacitor. So, I'm going to keep it on this wide field of shot because right now to maintain the voltage on the electrical system we have this battery where the lead runs around comes down and hooks into the positive rail system over here on this battery. This battery is going to become a super capacitor. The LTO battery in the bed or in the back of the truck is going to be the only storage um, like battery storage. The rest of it is going to be super capacitor based. So I don't want to redo all the programming on the vehicle. So we're going to leave the battery charger attached to this cap. And I'm going to very carefully disconnect the positive lead over here. And uh, we're going to switch out to the cap and then we'll bring the LTOs online. So to keep us from having a short of any kind while well, we're changing this mess around. I've already undone the 10 millimeter bolts holding the, we want to keep an idea uh, or an eye on that, on that uh, battery charger over there. thin layer of rubber down on that. Kind of prop this over and out of the way for a minute. We'll drop off our ground. <clears throat> Get rid of this old school garbage. You stay out of the way. A little bit of dirt and shit out here underneath the battery. I don't see... Oh, well, they do have a field meter here. On the ground line, that's interesting. Okay. Anywho, let me grab the vacuum cleaner real quick. Okay. So here's our brand new XS super capacitor that we uh, charged up just last night. Left it on the charger till 
just a couple minutes ago and uh, wrong ratchet wrong tool there we go thing did not want to go in there Whew. okay so now it's in there nice and tight okay and we'll hook up our negative Put on our support plate. Let's get it started. Get this started. Get this started. started now there might be a little differentiation in current here when I go to drop this positive lead on but I doubt it I seriously seriously doubt it oh. so I get on the phone with my good friend Brian Smith over at Truck CB Sales this morning. We were texting. And I'm like, yeah, dude, check out what I'm going to put in my truck. And he goes, oh, that's the only way to go. I said, what do you mean? He goes, oh, I've been doing that for two years now. And I'm thinking, man, really? Have I uh, been out of touch with you for that long, huh? Because we both have gotten so busy that we can't sit and BS all night long like we used to on the phone. And I'm like, so what balancer are you using? so on and so forth and so forth and he proceeds to go and give me the skinny sure enough he's been running LTO batteries in a super capacitor for two plus years and he was running them self-balancing for a while which is what we're gonna do my balancer that I have ordered is well somewhere between here and China I think or Taiwan which I'll do a whole video on that too. But for today's purposes, we're just gonna hook it up and we're gonna run it. Okay, Quantac, oh yeah. A little bit of arcing and sparking, not a lot. white okay let's go bring the LTOs online now yeah help myself before we take this all apart um, there's no battery in line right now none and uh, I just want to show you the pure Cold cranking ability of just super capacitors. We're running on strictly super capacitor. We just started the truck on super capacitor, no problem whatsoever. 100% on super cap. Which personally I think is cool. 
And if you listen to the starter, it kicked over like it was on crack. <laughs> All right, Dano. Let's bring it the rest of the way home. Sorry, guys. I couldn't help myself. I just had to do that on camera at least once or twice. This connection, this last connection on this particular setup in the electrical, I have been waiting to do for over three months. And I am super stoked to finally be here. Contact. Okay. Now, why that was so significant is because my truck is now fully super capacitored and LTO batteried. Rack it down till it's tight, or don't rack it down at all. Okay, so, I mean, I cannot describe to you <laughs> how important and how excited I am to have that connection done. Because now we have unlimited power. And the reason I brought up my buddy Brian is he shared some statistics with me. He is running a 32 pill on a LTO battery just like this, his super cap, and a single 370 Mechman. And he's easily able to obtain and maintain over 5,000 Berg continuous on that setup. Like, all the time. <laughs> it's done. It's all downhill from here. It only gets easier from here, you guys. All I gotta do is rip out my center console, mount up all the radios, Drop in my subwoofer. Drop in the RCA cables for that. Hook up some line sections. The hard part is done. This literally, not figuratively, literally means the hard part is now over. <laughs> and I mean the hard part is over. As of right now. I'm going to show you real quick what I had going on from this point of view. So that's our acrylic box. Um, I added this board. I'm going to put all my stuff on. Like somewhere about in here will go the new messenger. And then somewhere here in the center will probably be the sub. And then over here is going to be the permanent um, toolbox. But that is my LTO enclosure is in a half inch thick Lexan case. Well, let's go ahead and let's go around to the front of the truck and let's start this thing and let it start charging because there's some pros and some cons I want to talk with you guys about when it comes to running lipos. So in closing, I want to talk about the dangers of charging alternators and lithium and alternators and lithium in the mobile, okay? If you have a 90 amp alternator in your vehicle, you're going to have problems. Most modern, let's start here at the beginning. Most modern alternators have a fan that's inside the unit. So as the alternator turns, it creates a low pressure and it cools itself. Now, its amount of cooling is strictly dictated on its RPM level. The faster the alternator turns, the more air pressure there is, the better cooling you're going to get. Makes sense, right? Okay. Next thing you have to understand is that alternators inherently by their own design are very inefficient, like stupid inefficient. If you have an alternator that say for instance can produce 1000 watts of power, it's also producing 1000 watts of heat. So also in turn, if you have an alternator that can produce 30,000 watts, 
of output power that's usable, you're going to have 30,000 watts of heat generation. It's literally a 50%. The rest of it goes up in heat. Horribly, horribly, deplorably inefficient. Well, you say to yourself, great, well, how does that directly affect us? Well, there used to be a natural balance in the universe. Alternators were very inefficient, and lead-acid batteries, the chemistry that makes up the battery, makes it lean itself towards its inability to receive a charge. Means, <clears throat> fancy words say, old school lead acid battery can only take a certain amount of current in charge. The chemistry that makes up lithium batteries doesn't have that balance to it anymore. Lithium batteries will take almost anything you can put at them. So if you have an alternator that say does 90 amps, okay, it's also producing 90 amps of heat. So it's really, it's like a 180 amp alternator, but 80 amps of it are turning into heat in the alternator and its function. If you have the alternator spinning, let's say at some crazy high number, we'll say 2,400 or 3,000 RPM, let's say, you're getting lots of air, airflow through the alternator and it'll be fine. But it's still producing that 90 amp load because that's the most that it can produce. The lithiums are gonna drink all 90 of those amps and say, give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more until they're charged. If you try to charge at idle, Let's say you have a very heavily depleted lithium battery in your system, like a big one, like the size of what I've got in this truck, and you've got yourself a little 90 amp alternator, not these big bastards like this, but a little 90 amp alternator, and the motor's turning at 500 RPMs, this thing is spinning 800 RPMs or so, the plate that creates the fan action, the low pressure action, isn't moving enough air, but the alternator is still at its max output. There's no chemical restriction for the charge rate, so the lithium is going to pull as much current as it can get until it's full. If you are not careful on a hot day, you can very easily overheat your alternator and cause it to catch fire. So I strongly suggest like this thing's going to have stickers all over it. Battery dead, no jump start. No, super capacitors alone. But if those batteries that are in this truck get pulled down below 12.5, they're damaged and ruined. They've got to come out. I can't jump start and recharge the darn thing from zero. So I have to be very careful how I manage this. And if I did jump start it, the alternator is going to be pouring 400 amps into it as much as it can give it. And everything is going to get stupid hot and the alternator is just going to be sitting there at a, at a 9 dollar RPM. So be very much aware. Please go forward with using lithium batteries with caution. Educate yourself. Read as much as you can. Um, I have a balancer. Like I said, it's in the mail. It's on its way. I can let these self-balance for a couple months. It'll be all right. But ultimately, you'd want to have a balancer in play for each one of the cells to make sure all the cells are getting topped up evenly. And don't attempt to charge your lithium battery from a deep depletion with your alternator. It could, if you have a stock or low amp hour output alternator, cause serious problems. Now, they do make heat sensing where they put a thyristor and a thermistor and all this other shit up in the alternator. And then they measure how many RPMs it is. And it's got a thermal couple. And it picks up how hot the alternator is versus the amount of current flow. And it, it will scale the amount of amperage output of the alternator. They have those. They have alternators specifically designed for charging lithiums when they're in a deep state of discharge. These are not it. Anyhow, um, super caps are charged ish. The lithium batteries in the bed are charged ish. Let's, uh, let's give this thing a crank over and see how long it takes to run itself up to fully charged. And let's see what it pulls for current here. Hold on. There's an angle that works. How this is hooked up is this clamped over the positive lead going back to the LTOs. This is our voltage at this super capacitor up here in the front. Let's see how long this takes. Because I was using the LTOs as an experiment on something and I know that they're fairly depleted. So 
Jeez, it starts like it's on crack. Of course. Well, it's only pulling 160 amps at the moment. 165, 164, 158. Wow, you're failing me here, clamp over ring. 150, we're all the way down at 13.76 still. 148, 45, 44. That battery was seriously depleted. All right. 113. Thirteen point seven. See how that amp number come way up? That's two hundred and seventy amps. You see now I can engage alternator number two. Look at the inrush of the current. It's 300 and what, 90 something amps that we're putting on those LTOs right now, charging them up. We'll shut down that second alternator. 183, but we're up to 14.1. 130, 110. 120. Hmm. Let's let this charge for a few minutes. Well, here we are pulling somewhere between two and one amp at 15.1. So it tells me the LTOs are charged. The only problem is, is now that we've eliminated that lead acid battery, the Hall effect sensor, or the, the amp sensor, which is on the other side by the stock battery, is not seeing any current. So it's kicked on a check battery light. So I get to now move the sensor over to the ground leads for the alternator. Yay. Well, gents, this is it. This is where I'm gonna wrap this little portion of the video up. I appreciate you all tuning in. I wanna give a big thanks to Mechman, a big thanks to Excess Power, huge thanks to Excess Power. And last but always first, I want to thank every single one of you guys for tuning in and following along. And well, on to the next segment, which will probably come in a week or so um, with me installing radios and me putting a LP100 meter in here. I haven't made too sure if I want to remote the, the meter face for it or not. We're going to see. And what I mean by remote it is build like a completely custom enclosure for it and do some other fun stuff but I'm going to just sit here and watch this for a few minutes and then I got to figure out what I got to do to change the amp cell or the load cell so it shows that it is charging so on that note you guys have a good night enjoy the rest of your week I appreciate every single one of you tuning in to follow along and at no point did the alternators ever get over about 130 degrees so I think we're in the clear I'll see you guys click click